Welcome to Forestville United Methodist online community where we connect with the power, peace, and purpose of the Holy Spirit, celebrating the Spirit's role in gifting and guiding us into grace. My name is Chris Pinney and I'll be leading worship along with Michael Stanford and Reverend Monique Cherie Pierre. And today we also celebrate communion. So I invite you now to put this on hold and go and get a cracker or a piece of bread or even a tortilla and maybe a little glass of juice or even water and set them nearby so they'll be ready when we celebrate communion. All right. And now I invite you to take a nice, deep, relaxing breath. Hmm. Holy Spirit, fill our hearts with charity and kindle within us steadfast love as we sing this soft contemplative tune. The Holy Spirit calls us to live that truth today and every day. And now I invite you to take another nice, deep, relaxing breath, a breath of the Spirit. And now let's pray. Come, Spirit, like rain, refresh, renew, revitalize. Come, Spirit, like fire, embolden, enlighten, enkindle. Come, Spirit, like a mighty wind, move, challenge, energize. Come, Spirit, come, love, 
Make one, make justice, make peace. Come spirit, come kingdom, come love. Fill us with your glory. Let the spirit in you greet the spirit in us. Amen. The Spirit in me greets the Spirit in you. Alleluia. God's in us and we're in God. Alleluia. The Spirit in me greets the Spirit in you. Alleluia. The Spirit in me greets the Spirit in me. And so we pray, welcoming spirit, animator, sustainer. You greet us and we greet you. Gather now to rest in your presence, ignite true life in Christ, take up our hearts surrendered. Let faith be strengthened and purpose and passion. O Holy Spirit, thank you for tending to your light within us. Thank you for your power, peace, and purpose. Amen. Alleluia. All right. Some of my favorite stories in Scripture about Jesus come in interactions and encounters that Jesus has with unexpected people and also at unexpected times. The story we're going to hear next is about Nicodemus, and that fits the bill. Listen to this encounter. I'm reading from John chapter 3, starting with verse 1 through 14. There was a man of the Pharisee sect, Nicodemus, a prominent leader among the Jews. Late one night he visited Jesus and said, Rabbi, we all know you're a teacher straight from God. No one could do all the God-pointing, God-revealing acts you do if you weren't, if God weren't in it. Jesus said, you're absolutely right. Take it from me. Unless a person is born from above, it's not possible to see what I'm pointing to, to God's kingdom. How can anyone, said Nicodemus, be born who has already been uh, born and grown up? You can't re-enter your mother's womb and be born again. What are you saying with this born from above talk? Jesus said, you're not listening. Let me say it again. Unless a person submits to this original creation, the wind hovering over the water creation, the invisible moving, the visible, a, baptize, a baptism into a new life, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. When you look at a body, it's just that, a body you can look at and touch. But the person who takes shape within this form is formed by something you can't see and touch the spirit, and becomes a living spirit. So don't be surprised when I tell you that you have to be born from above, out of this world, so to speak. You know well enough how the wind blows this way and that. You hear it rustling through the trees, but you have no idea where it comes from or where it's headed next. That's the way it is with everyone born from above by the wind of God, the spirit of God. Nicodemus asked, what do you mean by this? How does this happen? 
Jesus said, you're a respected teacher of Israel and you don't know the basics. Listen carefully. I'm speaking sober truth to you. I speak only what I know by experience. I give witness only to what I have seen with my own eyes. There's nothing secondhand about this. No hearsay. Yet, instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. If I tell you things that are plain as the hand before your face and you don't believe me, what use is there telling you of things you can't see? The things of God. May God add a blessing to this reading. Uh, once there were three brothers who were uh, well into their years and whose minds were slipping a little. One called down to his brother from the bathroom and said, Emil, I have one foot in the tub and one foot on the floor. Am I getting in or out of the tub? Oh, for crying out loud, exclaimed Emil as he rushed up the stairs. He suddenly paused on the landing and he said to himself, am I going up or going down? The third brother, witnessing all this, said to himself, thank God I'm not like those two, knock on wood, which he did. Then he looked up and asked out loud, is that the front door or the back? Today we hear about Nicodemus and the encounter um, and the conversation and also how quite confused Nicodemus became. He's curious about Jesus, yeah, and maybe in his heart, you know, he might be actually wanting to come to faith, but he's struggling as Jesus teaches about being born again. And then he hears these words and takes them literally and gets more confused, asking, how can this be? What's interesting, though, and strikes me about this story is that Nicodemus is one of the few side characters in the Gospel of John. Um, by side character, I mean he's not a disciple, and yet he occurs several times throughout the Gospel of John. Here in this story we heard, just read, that's his main appearance in the conversation with Jesus. And then, again, he reappears in chapter 7 when Nicodemus kind of stands up for Jesus in the, among his colleagues uh, saying, hey, according to the law, we shouldn't judge Jesus before giving him a trial. And then that upsets all his listeners that he made that comment. And then he makes a third appearance. This time after Jesus' crucifixion, when Nicodemus accompanies Joseph of Arimathea to collect Jesus' body, anointed and bury the body of Jesus, the one that just got executed by the Roman authorities. And again, though this may not be the same as standing up and professing faith in Jesus, <laughs> uh, it's another significant step forward because by his actions, Nicodemus declares his allegiance to this one who had been executed actually by capital offense and thus, you know, courageously puts himself on the line actually. And that's what I think makes Dick Nicodemus um, so interesting as a character. He's the only side character, like I said, as far as I can tell, and he shows up multiple times. But the whole time, you can see that he's growing in faith. So at first, he just brings questions, and he's confused. And then he invites others to slow down and don't judge this man. And then he finally risks publicly honoring the one that just got executed. So coming to faith, at least for Nicodemus, uh, caught, uh, takes time. And his journey with Jesus continues across most of the Gospel of John. And, you know, we can assume it continues after that. And I think that it's a really good thing to hear this. For some, perhaps coming to faith is really or was really easy. You know, fast and strong and, uh, you know, doubt doesn't uh, occur much. And, you know, let's give thanks for that, actually. Let's give thanks for it. But for others, and uh, maybe for most of us, maybe for you, faith comes more in fits and starts, and it steps, you know, two steps forward in faith and one step back, or perhaps at times 
you know, things seem really clear, but then at other times, not at all. Or maybe faith feels like a lot more like, like an endless series of questions, but, but, how, how does this make sense? You know, um, instead of a whole bunch of easy answers and affirmations. So for those like that, the story of Nicodemus can really be wonderfully meaningful and encouraging. I read somewhere, and I couldn't remember where, that Nicodemus is the patron saint of curiosity, and I really love that. Uh, but I also think we could claim him as the patron saint of all those who have struggled, uh, those of us who have struggled with faith, uh, like not being satisfied with easy answers. Um, asking great questions. Uh, those who enter into a relationship with Christ Jesus and they relinquish needing to know all the answers because who does? Who does? <laughs> so even more than that, though, I think this story says a lot about, Nic not only about Nicodemus, but also about God. The divine is patient. Yahweh doesn't give up. If God keeps working in and on and through Nicodemus across three whole years of Jesus' ministry and 16 chapters in the Gospel of John, just think, God will keep working in and on and through me, in and on and through you, in and on through the church community, no matter how long it takes. And that's really, really, really great news. We learn this from the story of Nicodemus. A man and his family uh, went to a hotel staying overnight because the next, uh, that evening, excuse me, the man had to present a speech at a convention. And so he got all ready and the kind of uh, convention it was, was very on time. Like you really had to be precise in the timing uh, because there were a lot of events and things scheduled. So he knew that and he was really committed to being on time. So just as he left the hotel room, he realized he had misplaced his watch. <laughs> so the whole family and him start looking all over the, ho the hotel room for the watch, not finding it. But eventually, the father just shouts out, freeze, and everybody freezes. And they're all listening. And the quieter it got, suddenly they could hear the watch ticking. And that's the way they found the watch. In the silence, they heard the ticking. So they stopped and they listened. And that's, my friend, turns out that the stopping and the taking time and the resting and the listening and the reflecting and all those wonderful questions that emerge, they're all the gateway to faith. And faith is at the heart of the church, the church and its entire community worldwide. So in a letter to the church, that Paul wrote um, in the church that was in the city of Ephesus. He wrote this letter and he talks a great deal about the great transformation that God generates in their lives. Kind of the from death to life image he uses. And then he also describes and says how categories and divisions disappear when you're living in that place where Christ Jesus is. And then he prays. He prays for the church, sharing this powerful vision in the spirit that he has for them. And then by extension for us, let's listen. <laughs>
Spirit living in us, filling us and setting us free. Holy Spirit, here among us, dwelling closer than our own breath, beating out a rhythm of peace, power, and purpose. We praise you for loving community wherever it manifests around the world. We praise you for the abundance of welcome and hospitality community pours into our lives. It takes hard work of countless people to keep community alive, connecting with one another. Thank you for your sustaining grace. May your healing power pour forth, bringing balance and health. We pray for all in need of healing. Deliver us into expansive thinking and empowering solutions in a hurting world. Deliver us into courage and a vision of your peaceable kingdom. Raise up more and more who are bent on living compassionate justice. Thank you for your work within us as the church, mobilizing us for loving service. Move us into sustainable pathways, allowing life to flourish and your life within us to shine forth. We pray in the name of Jesus. Please join me now in praying the Lord's Prayer, the contemporary version. The words will be on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In World War II, you know, incredible harm was done, and millions died, of course. Yet in all the horror that was unleashed then, there are some incredible moments of light and love and courage. A German soldier named Private Joseph Schultz was one of them. He was sent to Yugoslavia shortly after Germany invaded that country, um, he, was a, he was a loyal young soldier, he was a private, and um, he went on uh, uh, what, patrols, that's what he was doing. One day the sergeant called out eight names, and his was one of them, and the eight young men thought they were going on some routine patrol as usual. As they hitched up their rifles, they came up over a knoll, 
and still not knowing what their mission was, there were eight Yugoslavians, five men, three women, standing there. It was only when those eight soldiers got about 50 feet close to these Yugoslavians when they realized what their mission was. The eight soldiers were lined up. The, sol soldier, the sergeant yelled, ready, and they lifted their rifles. And then he yelled, aim, and they got their sights. And then suddenly in the silence in that moment, they heard this thud of a rifle butt hitting the ground and they look up. Uh, the sergeant and the seven other soldiers and the eight Yugoslavians watch as Private Schultz begins to walk towards the Yugoslavians. The sergeant yells, come back, and Private Schultz does not. He walks all the way there. He gets in line. He reaches out and holds the hands of the one Yugoslavian on one side, the other. There's a moment of pause, and then the sergeant yells, fire. And Sar Private Schultz's blood is mingled with all those Yugoslavians. Found on his body after was a scrap of scripture uh, from St. Paul. And it read, Love delights not in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. In this world, horrendous things happen. Wars rage, suffering unfolds. Yet in the midst of all this, there is a spirit-filled light, and no darkness can extinguish it. No action can overcome it. Whatever faith questions arise, whatever struggles and challenges are endured, whatever adventures of the spirit accompanied with trust, hope, and perseverance in the spirit, we are on this path of light, of communion, of love. Jesus, on the night he gave himself up for us, gathered his dear ones for a meal. As we prepare now to celebrate the sacrament of communion, the Lord's Supper, let's sing together Walls Marked the Boundaries by the Strathtees. Walls mark our boundaries and keep us apart. Walls keep the world from our eyes and our heart. Tables are round, making room for one more. Welcoming friends we had not known before. So build us a table and tear down the wall. Christ is our host, there is room for us all. Walls make us sure who is in and who's out. Walls keep us safe from all questions and doubt. But at a table in open exchange, new ties are formed as our lives rearrange. So build us a table and tear down the wall. Christ is our host, there is room. We were strangers, divided alone. Hate and distrust built a wall, stone by stone. Now at a table, the bread that we share joins us to Christ in a circle of care. So build us a table and tear down the wall. Christ is our host. There is room.
Christ Jesus, by your life and through your suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us into freedom, joy, and compassion, and made a new covenant with us by water and the Spirit. On the night of your portrayal, Lord Jesus, you took bread, blessed it, and broke it. You gave it to us, your disciples, saying, Eat this, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body. And when the supper was over, you took the cup. Again, you gave thanks and praise. This cup that is poured out is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it in remembrance of me, you said. And so, in remembrance of all you have done, O God, we offer ourselves to you in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's suffering and offering for us. Pour out your spirit upon all of us in this online community and pour out your spirit on these gifts of bread and juice. Make these gifts be the body and blood of Christ Jesus so that you and I and all of us can be the body of Christ in the world, loving and serving. Abba, Father, let your kingdom come. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. And now taking your bread, this is the body of Christ. And now the cup. This is the cup of new life. Send us to the world. Glory to you. Amen. Well, here we are declaring into the world Holy Spirit's power, peace, and purpose. And now we offer ourselves and our gifts in gratitude for all blessings. Through generous financial gifts, the church grows loving community. So thank you for supporting the ministry of Forestville United Methodist Church. So give now by simply going on to the forestvilleumc.org website and pressing the donate button, or you can mail in your offering to Forestville UMC 6550 Covey Road, Forestville, California, 95436. And if you'd like to learn more about our ministry, go to the forestvilleumc.org website. And th again, thank you very much for your financial support. And now receive this blessing. 
Move out in power, peace, and purpose. Do all the good you can in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, for as long as you ever can. Amen. We'll see you next time.